big dreams of striking it rich. He and his wife, Dio, agreed to devote one year of their lives to the treasure hunt. His deal with Kip Wagner? A 50-50 split on anything they found after the state of Florida collected its share. Mel sold his home and his scuba diving business in California to raise cash for expenses. He also assembled a crew that agreed to move to Florida and work for one year without promise of pay. I can never do it by myself. I don't count the people out. One in particular held the key to finding fortunes. A self-taught electronics genius named Faye Fields. He had built his own proton magnetometer, the Spanish galleons from the 1715 fleet, which sank on this popular treasure route along Florida's east coast. It was Fields' magnetometer that helped lead to their ocean graves. And it was Mel Fisher's own invention of the mailbox that helped uncover the past. We turned that thing on for 15 minutes and talk about success. In 15 minutes, I uncovered thousands of these gold doubloons, just dazzling, blinding, beautiful. We covered cannons, silver plates, pieces of eight, even an entire chest of Spanish coins, still bonded together by the elements of time. It was the lost wealth of a past empire, rising from the sea a quarter century later to fill the missing pages of history. Those were the early days of treasure salvers. divers kept office and a museum of finds aboard the golden doubloon a life-size replica of a spanish galleon yet even at this point they were never rich all money was poured back into ocean excavation since then a steady discovery of small relics and coins from spanish wrecks was enough to keep them going in those beginning years of struggle but the crown jewel of sunken wrecks was always on their minds that fabled ship, which had evaded treasure hunters for centuries, reputed to be carrying more wealth than any other ship in the history of treasure fleets, the Atocha. The year is 1622. Spain is at the height of its empire, the vanguards of European exploration and colonial expansion. Less than 100 years after sending Columbus on his first journey to the New World, the Americas have become Spain's backbone of wealth importing countless amounts of copper, silver and gold, tobacco, gems, jewelry, you name it, Spain ships at home. The distance is vast and without satellites or radar, unpredictable Caribbean weather can catch even the most formidable seafarers off guard. The Spaniards were following this trade route for 300 years and they lost a lot of ships. In the summer of 1622, the Spanish spent two full months loading an admiral's galleon named Our Lady of Atocha with immense amounts of treasure. Before embarking home, she set sail to meet up with the rest of her fleet in Cuba. Well, one day after they left Havana, they got hit by a hurricane. The admiral's galleon and eight other ships are slammed against shallow reefs near the coast of Key West. Before long, she sings, rattled right over all of her precious cargo. Until we found it. 
400 years, just right there on the bottom. I had read about the Atocha in a book called Potter's Treasure Diamonds Guide. And it had four stars next to the name, which meant it had a, a big cargo on it. So he decided to go look for it. After four full years of looking, the first clue was finally located in 1971, the Atocha's anchor. And then we started following this trail. And right about here in 1973 and 74, we found some silver bars and coins, a bunch of gold. But this really wasn't the main pile. No, no, but we found so much stuff there, we figured the rest of it has to be close by. We started looking around that area, digging holes, and, and we just didn't find it, you know? Reality had set in. This ship was pulverized, and its treasure scattered all over the seafloor. There's no telling how long the rest of it would take to find, if ever at all. The unthinkable happened. The salvage boat, my brother Dirk ran the Northwind capsized in the middle of the night, and he and his wife and another diver were trapped inside. Mel's son Dirk and his wife Angel didn't survive. It's a powerful ocean. It takes people and ships. It was the only time I really saw my dad discouraged. Lesser man would have given up. It takes incredible determination to accomplish great things. For the next 10 years, they followed a slim trail of breadcrumbs across seven linear miles of wide open seas. It was 10 years to the day after Dirt's accident on July 20th, 1985, that the crew radioed to shore. Throw away the charts! We've got it! We've got it! You know, it was an 80 foot long pile of silver just sticking up out of the mud. It, it was incredible. Atocha's main pile ended up being six miles from the first piece they found. It's no wonder it took a lifetime to locate. It's just too much to believe at once, but that it finally happened after all these days and years of talking about finding the mother load and then actually looking at it, it was uh, really a lot to handle. Any treasure hunter will tell you, it's not the discovery, it's the quest that drives the adrenaline. Once the treasure is found, it's the daily drudgery of recovery. And so it is with the Atocha. Every day, more treasure is being brought aboard to be tagged and documented. It comes in bags, buckets, and baskets. Pieces of eight and silver plates. 105 emeralds and 200 pounds of gold. And there are silver bars, tons of them. So far, over 900 silver ingots, weighing from 60 to 80 pounds apiece. 
50 feet below, a salvage team works meticulously through the wreckage, measuring and tagging each pile of timber, and photomapping every square inch of the ship's hull. A comprehensive photo mosaic will be put together from these archaeological grids, along with a complete record of each artifact. The result should be an accurate picture of not only how the Atocha came to sink, but how galleons were made in 17th century Spain. While the actual hunt for treasure is over, the hunt for history has just begun. Treasure Salvers headquarters, a converted naval warehouse in Key West. What was once a quiet, laid-back island office is now a bustling center of research. There are banks of computers, white-coated lab technicians, security guards, and students like Adam Ravage, who is the Our World Underwater Scholarship recipient to watch history unfold. And every day there is another discovery that mankind has not seen in 350 years. This entire third floor, once a storage area, is now an enormous conservation laboratory for the cleaning, restoration, and recording of each individual treasure, goods which will later be divided among the investors of treasure salvers. But for now, silver bars rest in huge piles creating a surreal canyon of treasure. 47 tons of silver in all, including 908 silver bars, 500 wares of silver, and over 150,000 silver coins. Each awaits its turn at being cleaned by the most expedient method, electrolytic reduction. Once inside these tanks, an electrical current is passed through the metal to loosen the surface corrosion and more importantly, remove the salts that permeate the metal. It's a slow but thorough process. Each day, another eight silver bars are cleaned. Another 600 silver coins are restored. A few of them immediately go on display in the gift shop below. The rest are moved on to the new curating department, where the actual documentation takes place. Here, every item is checked against its tag number, site location, and description on the ship's log. Individual coins are weighed, cataloged, and recorded in the main computer. What was once an encrusted blackened stone is now a bright, shiny piece of eight, bearing inscriptions of legends, royalty, and mint marks of cities and dates, many of which were never known to exist. A quarter million such coins were listed on the manifest of the Atocha. So we're dealing with a large number of coins. And by looking very closely at both the obverse and reverse side of the coin, we're able to tell that they're from the Mexico City Mint, some are from Lima, some are from Santa Fe de Bogota Mint, that only opened in 1621, one year before the ship sank. And many of the coins come from the great silver mine down in Potosí. So by studying these coins and by learning uh, about them, 
we're not only rewriting the whole numismatic history of the New World, but it also is telling us a lot about the social history and the economics during this very early period. And you record the information, and then we're going to be having other scholars come in and work with us to find out what all this information really tells us. The day before yesterday, brought in eight or ten million bucks worth of magnificent animals, and I just cried. that these are priceless jewels. There's, there's never been such a large collection of these emeralds found anywhere in the world before. We were really looking for emeralds. And we hit this pocket of emeralds and just scattered them all over the place. We nicknamed it Emerald City <laughs> because uh, whenever we go out there, we find emeralds. So we have one diver in the water with a dredge that's connected to a box on, on, on the river here and a sluice box system of water running through different screens, bringing with it the sand and the shells that are being dredged up. And we are sifting through the sand for the emeralds, as opposed to diving and uh, doing excavation underwater, we're getting a, a more thorough job done finding them that way. And so that's the way we're doing it now. One of the most exciting things about discovering a deep water wreck site is that it generally is found in its entirety. Ocean currents, oxygen, and light do not affect them like they do shallow water sites. Kim Fisher recently received detailed reports from his research team on a number of deep water shipwrecks that are loaded with treasure. The first one of the company's sites is codenamed The Lost Merchant and is suspected to have roughly $200 million worth of treasure on it. An area of high probability has been identified, and electronic surveys are now underway with the Fisher's newly developed HAUV, or Hybrid Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. With this cutting-edge technology, the Fishers are very optimistic in finding the deep wreck of the lost merchant, 
as well as the remaining treasures of the Atocha and Margarita. To date, well over a half a billion dollars in treasure has been recovered from these wreck sites. But according to the ship's manifests, salvage records, and the research of shipwreck historian Dr. Eugene Lyon, there are roughly 162 copper ingots, 14 bronze cannons, 125,000 silver coins, 433 silver bars, and 111 gold bars still missing. In addition to the listed cargo, the stern castle of the Atocha remains unfound. The stern castle holds 35 boxes of unregistered cargo and an untold amount of jewelry, rough gems, and other riches belonging to the Catholic Church. The expected value of this remaining cargo will exceed $280 million. He accomplished his dream. You know, he had a lot of negative stuff come at him. The government tried to take it away. I lost a brother. He never let that slow him down. He just pushed all that negative stuff aside and kept going. And, and he always said, today's the day we're gonna find it. And he was right, we did.